Okay, back again. Um, I'm going to do one more recording. Uh, we'll start with chapter 30 and see where we go. So chapter 30, let's go ahead and share, share. Dun, dun, dun. Chapter 30, where did we leave off? She's got Goshen in her cave because she saved him from a bear trap. And he's sort of um, taking advantage of her niceties for sure, uh, saying, oh, we've got a lot of food saved up as if the work that she's put in to prepare for winter uh, includes him and he's able to eat her stuff and she's just going to be fine with it. Um, she Everywhere she goes and everything she does, she carries her musket with her. Uh, she went down and she emptied out his gun, which was down by the bear trap, and she also dumped out all his powder. She made him a crutch. She's really wanting him to leave. She feels like he might start some trouble. So she mentions the fact that uh, Long, what's his name of the Indian, Long Knife, uh, the, the husband of the um, couple who had shown up with the two little girls and helped her uh, create a dugout, um, bring a big piece of wood up there. She's carving it out. Um, she's hoping that him thinking that Long Knife is planning on being there in a couple of days, so she totally lied about it, but she's hoping that he won't start any problems thinking that that's going to happen. So here we go, chapter 30. I fixed supper again for us, roasting two trout in the coals and making flour cakes. While we were eating, there was a scratching and the muskrat wandered out of the hole he had been living in since I brought him home. He chewed, his chewed paw was pretty well healed, but he had a limp as he walked and a list to one side. Goshen, who had not seen him before, stopped eating. Hell and I water, he sputtered. Where did you find that? In one of your traps, I said. Firelight shone on the animal's glossy coat. Prime pelt, Goshen said. It'll bring good money. It's not for sale, I said. He didn't hear me. Buy you a length of Lindsay Woolsey, he went on. A ribbon for your hair and a comb with sparklers in it. The muskrat went, the muskrat went back in its hole, frightened, I think, by the tone of his voice. After supper, I got out the Bible and started to read. He asked me if I would mind reading out loud. Haven't heard the holy book since I was at my dear ma's knee. I had turned to Proverbs. I read while he leaned forward and cupped his ears. As snow in the summer and as rain in harvest, so honor is not seemly for a fool. Makes powerful sense, Sam Goshen said. A whip for the horse, I read. A bridle for the ass and a rod for the fool's back. Right smart talk, Goshen said. He looked around for the muskrat. Fine pelt, that one. I'll catch me a few when my legs are working. There was no sign that he understood what I was reading or why I was reading it. I decided to try another part of the Bible, the story of jail. He waited impatiently for me to turn the pages. And the Lord discomfited Sisera, I read, speaking slowly, and all his chariots. How many chariots, Goshen broke in. 900 made of iron, I said. And who's this Sisera anyway? He was the captain of the armies of Jabin, king of Canaan. Go on, miss. The Lord discomfited to Sarah, I said, and all his chariots and all his host in the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. How be it, Sisera fled away to the tent of the to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, and Jael went on to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her in the tent, she covered him with a mantle. I have to pause, I forgot, my shrimp is on the stove. So let me stop share and let me, okay, I'm back. Let me share a screen. Hopefully it records correctly. Okay, um, let's see. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, turn in my Lord, turn in to me, near fear not. And when he had turned in unto her in the tent, she covered him with a mantle. Why for, Goshen asked, to protect him, I said, or so Cicero thought, some women folks are sly. I read on, and he said unto her, give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Again, he said to her, stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be, when any man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, is there any man here, that thou shalt say, shalt say no. I'm listening, Sam Goshen said. Then Jael Heber's wife took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly into him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. I stopped reading. Goshen waited with his mouth open. I closed the book. That all there is to it? 
he said. She killed him? Dead. With a nail? With a long nail in his temple. Sam Goshen stared across the fire at me with his cruel little eyes. He pawed at his own temple with two fingers. A nail? That would hurt a man bad, he said. No telling what some women folks will do if they get riled up. No telling, I said. He started to laugh and then started on a rambling story about one of his wives who got mad and hit him on the head with a length of sycamore wood. But I thought he knew why I had read him the story of Jael and Sisera. Whether it had done any good or not, I didn't know. It might have stirred him up to harm him, to harm me, it stirred him up to harm me. He didn't see the white bat until days later, although it had been hanging there above his head all the time he was nursing his leg. He was eating a bowl of morning mush when he happened to glance up and see it. It made him jump. He forgot he had a bad leg. He scrambled to his feet and picked up his crutch. Bad luck, he cried, a white one too. They're the worst. He raised the crutch and took a swipe at the creature. Before he could raise his hand again, I grabbed the crutch and threw it into the fire. I didn't say anything. He pulled the crutch out and wiped it off on his sleeve. I guess you think I don't need it to need it no more. True enough, not much around the house here, but outside that's different. He put on his heavy coat and his flap-eared cap. He opened the door and glanced out. Appears to be a good day for hunting, he said. I think I'll go and shoot us a deer. You don't mind if I take your brown bess along? I held the musket in my hand. I never put it down anymore. You have a musket of your own, I said. Mr. Goshen smiled, showing his mouth full of yellow teeth. So I have, so I have, he said. But I plumb forgot where I done left it with my fever and all. Makes a man forgetful, fever does. Your musket is down on the shore, I said, with the bear trap, where the bear trap is. He put the crutch under his arm and tried his weight on it. He teetered back and forth and looked pained. Still hurts, he said, but I'll bring you back a deer or die trying. I opened the door and watched him hobble off. It was a bright day with the sun glistening on the snowbanks and the blue drifts piled up along the lake. He was halfway down the slope when he disappeared behind a thick stand of mountain laurel. After a while, I caught a glimpse of him on the far side of the lake. He had dropped his crutch and was trotting along nimbly. Then he disappeared again. I got hold of the muskrat and took it out in the sun and let it go. Or rather, I gave it a push and made a noise I thought would urge it on. But it took a few steps, looked over its shoulder, and came back to the doorstep, where it sat the rest of the day in the sun until I took it in. It was close to nightfall when I saw Sam Goshen coming up the hill. He had the crutch under his arm again and was picking his way slowly between the rocks. I closed the door and set the bar. I waited for his knock. When it came, I didn't answer. I seen deer, Goshen shouted through the door. Seven fat ones trailing along, pretty as you please. But somebody done took my powder horn. Couldn't find my musket, eat neither. It might be that good for nothing long knife. He paused and I heard him his heavy breathing. Of course, it could be someone besides him. I kept quiet. Now, who'd ever do a thing like that, he asked. He sounded pitiful, but wasn't. He was mad. I could imagine his face through the thick wooden door glaring and ugly. Can't see who'd be so low down me. He cleared his throat and spat. It wouldn't be you who'd done it, would it be, miss? Yes, it was, I said. And if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to do worse, a lot worse. I'm going to shoot, clean through the door, and maybe kill you. There were no sounds for a while. I thought that he'd sat down to wait me out when I heard a lot of curses afterward. I heard footsteps going down fa fast down the trail. I didn't look out. I stayed up all night thinking he might come back. I heard every sound, wolves howling on the hill beyond, the, lack, the lake cracking and booming, the wind in the winter trees, the cry of a bobcat, and, a far away, and far away a night owl calling. But I heard no footsteps. Dawn came before I went to sleep. I slept all that day as close to the world as Gabriel the bat. When I opened my eyes, I lay and looked at the creature hanging upside down, wrapped in its silken wings. I closed my eyes thinking it would be nice if people when things got bad, could wrap themselves up and go to sleep. The fire was out when I woke up near midnight and I had to build a new one using powder, which I was short of. At home, if the fire went out, you could go to the neighbors and borrow some coals, but it was wonderful not to look over and see Sam Goshen lying in the corner. I hadn't realized how scared I had been all the time he was there. I opened the door and looked out. A few stars glittered, down, glittered far down in the south, but northward, the sky was black and a north wind blew hard. Ooh, that means a storm had come in. What do you think about that Sam Goshen? You think he really took off and went back to town or wherever he's from? Because in my brain, I'm thinking he's up to no good and I wouldn't trust him. He's going to be back. I worked on the dugout that night. I had hollowed out a good part of the pine log by the fire. We're on chapter 31. 
And now I chipped away at the rest with the ax. It was beginning to take on the right shape, at least I had in mind from what John Longknife had told me. My reading of the Bible to Sam Goshen was only the second time I had opened the holy book since my father's death. I brought it out again and leafed through it, reading from whatever I happened to turn to. First, it was Judges, then Chronicles, then Daniel and Hosea. Lastly, it was from the book of Esther. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people, white, green, and blue, hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. When I was a child, my father used to read this part of Esther's story to me. He was a frugal man, frugal because we were poor and by his own leanings, but he always liked these words and the scenes they pictured. I liked them too. I would ask him to read again and again about Ahasuerus, the king who reigned over 127 provinces from India as far westward as the land of Ethiopia, which is in Africa, who gave a grand feast for all his servants and nobles and the princes of Persia and Media in that marvelous palace of Shushan. As I sat there by the fire, I read out loud to myself. The words made strange sounds among the stone walls of the cave and the so softing, softing of the bitter wind, not the warm and exciting sounds I remembered as a child. The north wind blew all night and at dawn it began to snow and snow fell for five days, never stopping. When I opened the door, a wall of piled up snow loomed before me, shoulder high. I dug a path through it and, and away from the mouth of the cave. The earth was white as far as the eye could reach. Along the ridge above the cave, the pine trees looked like white candles. A herd of deer came to the edge of the path I had cleared. I think it was the same herd that I had driven away. Their eyes were half closed with ice. They were cold and starving. I went out and cut through the snow where it was thinner under the trees down to within inches of the earth, close enough to the dry grass for the deer to feed. It took me three days working half a day at a time as I carted the snow aside and cleared a place. The deer came along grazing behind me. The wind blew again, this time from the east. The smoke hole in the roof was covered with brush, but the wind found its way in. It scattered ashes everywhere. The cave was freezing cold. I bundled up in the rush mat I, was, I used on the floor and huddled against the log fire. I sat and thought about the tavern in Ridgeford and how warm it would be in the kitchen and how good bread with real flour in it would taste. The east wind lasted for two days. It ended in the night. The sun came up strong in a blue sky that glittered. I had run out of tea and sweetening. Sam Goshen was responsible for this and out of powder and shot and I needed another blanket. I was in the dire need of everything but I didn't wanna make the long journey to Ridgeford not because it would take all, all of three days coming and going in heavy snow, but because I still lived in fear of the British. They'd captured the town of White Plains a few days after I left the Golden Arrow, or so I had learned from Sam Goshen. By now that they might have marched north and captured the whole countryside. The ferrymen had said that they wouldn't bother to follow me, but I hadn't believed him. I didn't believe him now. I worried over this for a day. Then I decided I might risk the chance whatever happened. Wearing my snowshoes, I crossed the frozen lake at dawn and set off through the forest. The trail I had traveled before was hidden deep under the snow. I came to Ridgeford at dusk of the second day. I circled the village, hiding in the trees and looking for signs of the king's men. I saw nothing suspicious. The village looked the same as it had the day I left it, except that there, was, there were not as many carts on the street. I went to the tavern around to the kitchen door first and talked to a boy who was coming out with a tray of food. I learned that there were no king's men inside, but many of their sympathizers were. Now that they were winning the war, I slipped through a side door into the ladies' parlor. Just outside the parlor was the board where they put up notices. A drover stood reading a notice that looked to be new. I waited until he turned away. There were five notices on the board. Two wanted to know the whereabouts of a deserter from His Majesty's ship Rainbow. Two concerned runaway slaves from a plantation in Virginia. One concerned a felon who had escaped from Hartford prison. I read the notices twice. My name was not there. I felt better. I felt almost calm. With my last pence, I went down to the kitchen and made a bargain with the cook to let me sleep that night beside the oven. I still was uneasy about sleeping upstairs in the tavern, even though my name was not posted on the notice board. Okay. End of chapter 31. She made it to Ridgeford because she needs some stuff, right? Um, and there were no signs of the British men, soldiers. Um, yeah, and it's winter, right? Thank goodness she had those snowshoes. And I hope that Sam Goshen doesn't show up or he doesn't show up to her uh, cave while she's gone. Okay, I'm gonna go. Good night.